So, bienvenue Pierre, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, you will be disappointed because I will not start to talk about the GAIX Clearinghouse right away. And that's very much, um, take it as a course. Um, that's not going to be the usual presentation. And uh, we will start with something very simple of what are we going to talk about. Just need to put, yes. We need a scenario. We need a scenario, and the first scenario that we will talk about, that's Alice. Um, Alice wants to process farming data for marketing research. Okay, fair. Where do we find the data? So the next scenario is that Alice wants to process Bob's farming precious data. We know all the data is very precious for marketing research. And you will see that at the bottom slide of the, um, at the bottom of the slides, I'm putting presentation, I'm putting a small checkbox. To find Bob's farming precious data, we need to have a catalog for data. The data um, is not going to be processed on Alice laptops. That's not possible. So Alice also needs to find grid computing services to process that data. And now we have all the information that we can, we could stop here, but we also have, a, we can ask also a lot of ourselves a lot of questions. Where Alice is coming from? Um, does Bob granted their, its consent? Um, is precious data, where is it provided by? by? Um, is there any access right conditions? What are the grid computing service characteristics? And all of that, we need to define some additional information. So the full scenario that we will work on today is Alice from Acme wants to process Bob's farming precious data provided by Eve on the super cloud grid computing services for marketing research. That's, the, that's going to be our scenario for the next 40 minutes. And you will see that, you see that at the bottom of the slides, I've put a lot of checkboxes that things need to be done. We need to have a catalog for data. We need to have a catalog for services. Policy language. Where do we get those information? We get the information from policy information points. PIP. Some of you might be familiar with the XACML uh, specification. That's where it's coming from. You need to have an ontology for describing the grid computing services. You need to have the policy decision point of where you will get this, this negotiation, where this situation will be done. Finally, and we will talk about that, the governance. That's probably the most complicated word I will use today. That's going to be governance. Because Alice from Acme, they know nothing about Bob's. And maybe they don't have anything in common with also SuperCloud. And SuperCloud doesn't know Bob. And Eve have maybe no idea about SuperCloud. So we need to have a governance of all those rules, how they will play out. And the, the last one is KPIs. We, we don't live in a world which is like everything binary. We need to be able to measure. And this is very important to provide KPIs, key performance indicator, to navigate through that scenario. So we have this scenario. We've talked about data space before. And here I will ask, well, we, we, I've used color to try to distinguish three main groups of people, parties. We have the one with Alice, Acme, and the Research Institute. We have Bob with the farming data and Eve together. They're working together. And then we have SuperCloud, which is providing the uh, grid computing services. First question is that, is this my data space? Maybe there are other data space. Maybe Alice is part of a consulting company, Gartner, IDC, Forrester. And this is their data space. Maybe Bob's is part of a farming agri hub of some kind. Maybe SuperCloud is just providing infrastructure services, and this is one of the projects that we have for the association. So how many data space do you count here? Do we need data space? If everything is data space, spoiler, yes, we need them. But do we need a portal? Do we need, like, do we have this very formal way of, I need to enter into a data space to be used data space data? Um, the portal, once I'm in the data space, so-called in the data space, do I have access to all the data within the data space? Or is there any additional, more granular access right control? Then maybe if this is the case, we can create so-called data space on the fly. Maybe this data space is not something that we can draw. And here I have used these dash lines to show that this is very porous. So back to our scenario. We have Alice, Bob, SuperCloud, 
and they ask themselves about themselves a lot of questions. I'll just pick some of them. And I've used icons so you can, from the glance of the eyes, try to see how, what are they are talking about, what they are talking about. So they want to know about who is who. I will not go through all the bullet points. Um, who is Acme Corp, who is provider, who is SuperCloud, what is my cost to move the data out of SuperCloud once I've started to process my data there, what are the regulations that apply to every of the party involved in that scenario. Um, if I get my data for, if Alice gets data from marketing, can I use the same data for another purpose, such as advertising? Is it part of my contract? How Bob's enforce that this data is not used for something else? How Bob's manage to monetize, to trace that data? So all those questions basically can be summarized into the three pillars that we have with the association. So that was presented before, and I will take that for granted. At the end, we keep the same scenario, and we have a lot of functional requirement. So I've tried to simplify a bit all the questions. Data sets and services, you want to be able to advertise them, to monetize them, to publish them, to filter, to negotiate, to search, to compare them. Comparing is probably the most critical part. Identification of all the parties involved. Um, when you have a service, when you have a data set that comes with a provider, with the license rights owners, with the maintainers, they have access rights, they, have, they are part of, they are also living not just in the digital world, but in the physical world and they have regulation that applies to them. So you want to know how to negotiate part of those regulations. So each party must be able to express policies, permission, prohibition, duties, basic ones, and you will see why I'm talking about that. About at least regulation, the consent authorization. I might make a shortcut about consent and authorization. I'm using the same word for the two things because consent in the vocabulary is just for authorization too. But in the regulation, consent is very much linked to personal data, so that I'm going to make it explicit, consent and authorization. Data set service characteristics. And of course, you want that to be. That's where the fun starts. No lock-in, no lock-out, no centralization. Cheap, reliable, privacy preserving. You want to be able to verify that the policy you are negotiating will be able to um, traceability of this policy negotiation. You want to be able to enforce where your software will be able to, um, will, where it will be executed. I've talked about the decision, decision policy endpoints. That's where the policy will be negotiated. How do you trust the endpoint that negotiates your policy? If you don't trust the engine, maybe the engine has been uh, maliciously um, modified and just returns true every time. And at the end, you also want that to be extendable. So we have a list of requirement um, needs. And now we need to find how we make that available. And we have a list of all the characteristics, all the functional requirements that we had also at the bottom of that slide. So a bit of prerequisite. Don't, use the, don't take for granted the slides here. That's just that I was trying to, to find um, images I had the right on. So I'll use uh, old demonstrator pictures to highlight two words I will use, the ontology and the knowledge graph. Ontology is a way to represent, it's a semantic data model to represent a domain word. And GAIX has an ontology. And the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph, that's like the instance of the ontology. And the first thing that we deliver, so we have our first checkbox at the bottom of that slide. And that's the first time during my presentation where we start talking about GAIX. GAIX developed their ontology. And we saw that we have the requirement, no lock-in, no lock-out, cheap, reliable, and so on. So the way we've formalized and we translated those requirements to something that is tangible and operationable, we, we are going to use, we are using, not to use the future, I mean, there are people hiking downstairs and they are already doing that. We use verifiable credentials and linked data. It means that we manage to build a knowledge graph, but a decentralized knowledge graph where every party is own a part of that graph. And that's during the, during the negotiation that you combine all those atomic pieces of information to uh, negotiate. Part of the GAIX ontology we cover already, I've mentioned in the slides, participants, service offering, data resources, physical resources, we go down also to the GPS coordinate of the data center, that's also possible, copyright location. We use um, an effort also that we made is we don't want to reinvent the world. Um, there are already a plenty of ontology existing, so for example, data set, we are using, we are extending the DCAD v3 ones. Um, during some of the slides I will present, I'm also mentioning um, digital rights for GDPR. There are already ontology for those. Access point, uh, a strong topic about the network. I will mention that at the end. Attestation, declaration, certification, so on and so on. 
So finally, we have our first checkbox, the Gex ontology. I might hear the feedback, okay, yet another slide about the ontology. How does that translate? That's how it translates. So we have here a VC example, a verifiable credentials example. That's an extract from a working one. So I don't, for clarification and simplification, I cannot put all the field inside my slide, but that's really something that works. You will see here that you have a credential subject. So you have three parts, a list of claim attestation that are um, expressed in a way that you have subject, predicate, object, link data. You have the evidence, because here we're talking about an attestation, a second cloud specifically for people aware of that in France. And the issuer, the party that is cryptographically taking the responsibility to sign the claims. Something that I will come again on it later. So that's the party who cryptographically signed the claims, who who is, which is taking the responsibility of the claims. Another example, and this is a very important part of the knowledge decentralization of that knowledge graph. Bob has a car, uh, um, or Bob is a farmer. This claim itself can be signed by Bob itself, so Bob signed the claim that he is a farmer, that Bob is a farmer, but Alice or Bob's friends could also sign a claim saying that Bob is a farmer. Here, for example, we have the notion of notary that we have introduced. The notary is doing the work of ver validating that there is a prior certification about second cloud on a scope, which is really here really well defined by a data center and a grid computing. The ID are here pointing to another credentials, so that's how we build this knowledge graph. You, you fetch, you resolve the identifier, and you get another piece of the information. If you are interested, by the way, on how that play out, we have a compliance workshop at 2 o'clock, a bit of advertising, and we will have a notebook to play with that. We need to move on. We have a lot of checkbox to do, so um, to fill in. The governance. I mentioned that governance is the set of rules, and behind this word, we have the list of, well, we've mentioned mandatory rules per classes. Who is able to issue what type of claims? the root certificate or the list of did methods that we allow, and that will evolve. How to perform remediation, how to perform revocation. And I'm giving here an example of GaiaX governance. That's the GaiaX labels. And that's one of the three artifacts that was mentioned before as a deliverable of the association. So here I'm giving an example of the, one of the criteria for label through level three, some requirement needs to be fulfilled. That's the, that's the governance. And this governance is the first layer of interoperability. If you want Bob and Alice going back to our, uh, sorry, going back to our scenario, if you want Bob, Alice, SuperCloud to work together, they have to agree on those rules. And this is, the, the first step is not to just to pick one technical stack of open stack, Kubernetes or whatnot. That's, do we speak the same language? So that's this governance. And this governance, I've mentioned that we need to make the difference between the party that is part of the claim and the party that is cryptographically signing the claims. An example is uh, here, where here I have a VC, so the same thing that I had before, credentials. And here I'm putting a verification method, so verification that method links to a key. The key is resolved to a DID document. The DID document will contain, for example, here the, set, the attribute x5u, which is part of RIC, RFC. Um, 57515, five, if I remember correctly, from GWT. Um, those rules, that's part of the governance. That's the technical translation of the governance I've mentioned before. Mandatory rules, uh, the context that needs to be used from the GAICS registry, all of that we store inside the GAICS registry, the list of schema, shape, trust, and coordinatory there. That's the direct translation of the GAICS governance. And we have the second check marks. So I might lose some of you, so we are going back to the scenario. We still have Bob's, Alice, and SuperCloud. And now we have the ontology, the governance. So they know how to describe that, and they, if they adopt the same governance, then they are speaking the same language. We need to have a policy information point and the policy decision points. So for enabling for operationalize that, what we do is that each party will start to describe their own services and data set. So they're signing things. So Alice, or Alice employers, like me Corp here, will sign a claim saying that Alice is an employee. Alice might sign a claim saying that they have a degree in marketing research. 
uh, Bob will do the same thing, and SuperCloud will do the same thing. And they store that in the credential store. I'm not sure, some people might use agent, wallet. Credential store, it will say technology agnostic or a bit more safe word to use here. That's the first part. The second part to verify that we have the same adoption of the rules, the governance and the autology, is to get your GAIA-X credential. And that's where the clearinghouse um, enter the picture. So each party will send for validation, which is not a verification, validation, their credentials to the GAIX, to one of the GAIX clearinghouse, clearinghouse, and store the results of that validation in their own credential store. So now we have a bit more checkbox fulfilled. Police information point, you need to get, you need to, to, to reach out to the credential store. You, you know also have, you know, sorry, you also have now the place where you take your decision point. So that's where you have the clearinghouse that validates. Okay. Part of this first scenario also, you had the um, need to express rules, to express a contract, terms and conditions, contract, and user license agreement. You have a lot of them. In Gaia, we choose to use ODRL for open digital right language because this is, um, by consensus, a good um, solution to be used as an intermediate language. We have a lot of other initiatives that have a higher level of description language, more oriented towards legal, and we have also another set of languages that are a bit more towards execution and code. So ODRL is a good way to translate from, translate to. What is ODRL? I'm giving you an example. And this rule, this contract, is, for example, the output of the negotiation between Bob and Alice. Here we have, so that could be a contract that is issued by Bob. And Bob grants the permission, well, I cannot use my shadow to point at things, but you have to trust me, permissions, assign it to a participant, which is Alice, from ACME, using a did identifier, did identifier that points to a Saviton point, Saviton point that will point to the credential store, credential store that will return the VC about Alice. So all of that is very much linked to what I've described before. And it's allowing here, allowing Alice, for the purpose of marketing, to use email addresses, social network, and they can use and store that. That's the exact translation of the scenario we had. And we can translate, we can translate this um, turtle representation um, as a graph, and we can apply that also and, and compute the contract. So now we have another checkbox. That's the policy language. We are getting closer to the end. Back to your scenario, we have the credential store, we have the ontology, we agree to the same rules, we have the policy negotiation, we need to have catalogs. So for catalogs, we will focus now a bit more on the credential store. And I will use to illustrate how it will work only one of the credential store, otherwise the schema just go a bit messy. The first thing is that the credential store owner, the holder, will push the ID, will, will advertise the ID of their credentials, so not the credentials itself, because you remember we had one of the requirements which was preserving privacy. So you'll put the ID of your credentials inside a GAIX publication subscription services. You write there, the ID on it. And then you have catalogs that will either pull or receive an event that will see that there is a new ID available. They can resolve the ID, negotiate with the credential store, I'm the catalog from, um, we need to find another name. Do you allow me to access your credential node? That's how the holder always have this data control. You remember one of the slides from the previous presentation, you have the, the user at the beginning and the user in control. That's exactly the direct translation of that. The holder of the credentials through the credential store can negotiate the access right, whether or not the, he will present their credential, the information, part of this decentralized knowledge graph to the, to the set of federated catalogs. And this triggers here goes for every of the other uh, credential store. We have a hacking uh, session about that, and uh, for the purpose of the hacking session, we also provide infrastructure to play, out, play, to play uh, with the publication services for the time of the event. And the final one, so now I have catalog, uh, catalog for data and services, that's the KPIs. Someone mentioned, I think that was also Francesco, 
the market will always move faster than the rules. I mean, in every history, we saw that the legislation, the rules come after the technology. So we cannot live in a world which is just, I'm in or out. It simply doesn't work. So the gaze compliance alone is a very good start. And that's the baseline that we still require and which is mandatory to assess, measure whether or not we have the same rules, the ontology, the governance. But we need to go a bit further. And that's how we introduce other KPI indexes. Three of them, the veracity, the transparency, and the semantic match. The veracity, that's um, GAIX is very much Using a, lot, using a lot of cryptographic materials, cryptographic routines. So we can lean on that to know exactly what is the chain of key pair that is being used from the claim being signed to the root certificate. And every time you have an intermediate, you do a right delegation. So root, intermediate, another intermediate, another intermediate to the leaf. The, the, more, the more lengthy um, the chain is, more right delegation you had, my, more malicious um, you increase the likelihood, the likelihood of having malicious actors within that chain. And you also have the number of chains. If the same claim has a very long chain but is signed multiple times, then you, on the other side, increase uh, the, the, the trust in it. The next one is transparency. Simple one, um, mandatory compliance. So your ratio is at least equal to one. If you describe more than required, then the ratio will be greater than, greater than one. And that's another way maybe to also order services in a catalog. We just talk about the catalogs. If just we have thousands of thousands of guys compliance services, which we have already, but how do you distinguish them? How do you compare them? And I've mentioned that comparison is one of the challenging parts that we need to address. So transparency here is one of the indicators also. I've mentioned that we use a graph. Graph, that's a mathematical object. We can compute a lot of metrics on the graph, the eccentricity, how wide, how span is that? Does it gather or, uh, around one key issuer? Um, how much have described the service composition, the description of all the resources and dependencies? That's something that we can analyze and assess with metrics. And the final one is the semantic match. It's a very, very interesting one, and you have a great presentation uh, within the session, um, the next two days, about semantic match or DRL. Um, so please uh, join them, they are going to be great. We can recommend vocabularies, but we have to go a bit beyond that. I mean, if we just sit and, and have service offering with terms and conditions and 20 to more PDF pages of English text, okay, fine. You will send to the, that to your legal department, and maybe one day they will come back saying that, yes, no. What we want to do is to enable more semantic match for that negotiation. And we've seen in the last couple of weeks a huge development around a large language model, all the things that are whatever GPT thing. So we can use that also to model contract. You have still human supervision to verify, but that's something that you can use. So that that's will be the last Checkbox. So now we have everything. And we are back to our original scenario. You have Alice from Acme. They want to process Bob's family data from the provider Eve on SuperCloud Green Computing Services for marketing research. And we have a way to search for them, catalog, services, data, a policy language. We have information decision portal. Where do we get the information? No one has centralized or ownership of all the information. We already have this, we already fulfill this requirement of no locking, no lockout. This is based on existing standards, so this is cheap, this is reliable, this is scalable. We have an ontology that we still work on, we will um, extend it. And we have the governance and a mean to measure what's happening. I have 10 minutes still. So what's next? We have we are far from being done. We are very, very far from being done, but we are already making great progress. On the ontology, there is a specific area where we would like to focus. That's everything that relates to hardware security and network interconnection. I don't see the audience, but just by a raise of hand, who knows what is the picture on the top right? Three people? Okay. You probably have one of them on your laptop right now. 
That's a TPM module. TPM modules allow you to store keys, and that could be the hardware anchor to verify the full chain of stack execution. So that's going to be one of the key elements for the uh, policy information point that we just talked about. I mean, if you have a policy engine, but you have no control of where this policy engine is being executed, and you don't trust, or you don't um, know where this engine is being executed, how much confidence do you have that the engine is not a malicious one? And that can be done, that can be verified through this TPM secure boot, conf the area of confidential computing in general. And the internet connection is also extremely important. There is something that I've said a few times, the data doesn't flow on rainbows, um, and that's still true. Meaning that if you want to move data from just there to there, you need to have a cable. I mean, just here we see cables. Cables, that's the network. Without network, you don't have anything. So it's extremely important to be able to model that network. It's also very complex. And this is not just the ISO standard level one, level two. You can do level two, layer two on top, encapsulated inside a level three. So that's, that's we need to find another thing. Uh, no lock-in, no lock-out, no centralization, but we still want to have this uh, confidence that the policy execution is doing great, so we need to have traceability of the execution. So we need to find a way inside the contract to negotiate where you will store your contract results. So the traceability of the contract negotiation. The right itemization also is extremely important. We talk about Alice from Acme. Acme, that's probably a big corporation. They have headquarters in different um, uh, one headquarter, but subsidiaries, maybe in different countries, they need to be able to delegate rights to their department, department manager, to the employee, and so on and so on, and an employee to their machines. I mean, this is also going to the machines. So we need to have, for example, selected disclosure about the credentials, how much do I want to share to the outside? And part of the ontology we also order, so this is what we call a taxonomy, we classify, put in a tree, some of the vocabularies. So if I'm granting you the right to do marketing, then you can do also social marketing and direct marketing. But if I'm granting you the right to do direct marketing, then you cannot do social and um, media marketing. So that's the right attribution that we're talking about. About selective disclosure, there was already an implementation of selective disclosure, kind of selective disclosure, in the outcome of the GAIX compliance results. The compliance for the clearing house, you send your credentials, and you will, get, uh, you will get another credential saying that the credentials that you've sent are guys compliant. But the, the credential that you get back doesn't contain all the information. It contains, in fact, an array of an ID of the credentials and the hash of the credentials. And that's the first implementation of selective disclosure, because you can then share this guy credential that say, I'm guys compliant, I fulfill all the requirements, and then you can implement your own, again, credential store, where you have the ID, you resolve the ID, and we go through the same scenario that we have explained already. And the, the verifier can use the hash value to verify that the credential he gets is, gets is really the same one that you, you run the compliance on. So this is the first implementation, for example, of selective disclosure. And the final one, I've already talked a bit about that, that will be the semantic match, so text to ODRL, um, you can use natural language processing or a large language model. The second part where we need to have semantic match, semantic analysis, that will be on the classification of the data sets and services. As I said, um, we are living in a world that is going evolving extremely fast. Um, just the model of every week we have a new AI model, we have new database services, where is the boundary between a database and the computing services? We have now a database with FPGA that allows us to accelerate processing of data, that have database some features to process data more efficiently than just retrieving the data, processing it locally, and then sending back the results. So we envision an ontology where you describe more atomic, at the atomic level, your characteristic of your services, so CPU, RAM, and then maybe storage and network, and then there is an automatic classification of where this service will belong based on the research and the filter that the user used. We've talked about the catalog before. That's the first slide of the what's next, but that's a bit future. So if you are more interested about what's next, like next, next today, and that will be my next, uh, end of the presentation, 
all the source code that I've shared today, that's open source, based on open source libraries in the GitLab of the association. So we really much welcome developers to join, to use uh, those tools to put, to, to at, if an issue, open an issue, even better, open a magic request. And there is a compliance workshop at two o'clock uh, upstairs, two four, where we'll have a technical deep dive about what I've presented today, uh, a use of the wizard and also Q and A. Thank you very much. I hope that was uh, a clear presentation of where we are, uh, where you saw from a user point of view down to the infrastructure, to, down to the technology, how we link uh, Bob's present exchange data with Alice, and, and how technically we translate that into very concrete operation. I will be um, around for the next two, uh, two days, so don't hesitate to reach out and ask any question you have, and after the event also. Thank you very much. Merci, Pierre. Merci for the explanation. You, you, uh, I have a lot of questions for you. Maybe all the people have questions for you. Can you explain which is, what do you think is the most difficult challenge we have in the technical part? The challenge all, in all the of, uh, I think <laughs> there is a lot of challenge. What do you think is the biggest challenge we have? The biggest challenge is this scalability and market adoption. We need to make sure that the technology is convenient. When you see the adoption of great services today, it's because they are convenient to use. So in today's presentation, I was opening under the hood and showing you how it works. Most of you probably will not use that or will just use a catalog with a UI and, and easier tools. So we need to make sure that this technology is convenient. One of the things I've said before is that every day we use a car, every day we use a microwave, probably that very few of us, maybe none of us, I don't, know how to build a microwave or how to build and design a car. But they are convenient to use. So to make this technology convenient and make sure that there is adoption. That will be the most challenging part. One of my questions always for, because for me, I think it's very difficult, is how, how we will succeed with the semantic. Even in uh -huh. one language, it's difficult, the semantic, but in different languages. Here, we have a lot of countries now, and how we will deal about it with the semantic? We will work on it together. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any answer, better answer than that. We will, yeah, that's an approach that will be iterative. That's the same thing that we have in our natural language. I mean, I don't know, uh, for French, the language is evolving. I'm sure that's also the case in different languages. So the semantic that we have is also evolving, and that's something that we'll, uh, we'll have to, as I said, all work together on. I think the, the, the answer is always we need to work together. Thank you very much. Merci Welcome. beaucoup, Pierre. <laughs> and, okay, we, 